you were talking a little bit about um, HRV mm -hmm. and that's and you talk about heart rate variability and I wanted to talk about we, we were talk, chatting a little bit about this before before we got on camera and um, for for measuring so, something that people can like you know maybe on their wearable device yep measure a marker of recovery now you said subjective how you feel wins yep okay um and it seems to be the case with almost everything <laughs> like like yes. how hard are you going do you feel like how what's your heart rate going up to or do you feel like your perceived exertions oh your perceived exertion is going to win right yeah yeah um so ben levine was on the podcast and he was actually arguing that heart rate variability is extremely variable mm -hmm. in terms of the way it's it's measured and you know he he just sees tons of variability like plus or minus 25 percent constantly depending on like the variety of factors the time of day their breathing just everything like that um and he likes to look at resting heart rate like first thing when you wake up in the morning what's your resting heart rate as a good marker of recovery and if your resting heart rate's higher than it should be then it's kind of like okay maybe you're you're getting into this over non-functional overreaching which i want to talk about go. over training yeah um but hey, nice but use, by the way. Good it, dig. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> uh, but HRV. So, do you think there's, you know, if 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 there's some way people can kind of follow this consistent measurement protocol, same time of day, same posture, same controlled breathing, or something that they do like a controlled breathing thing before they measure it, something that's giving them, yeah. you know, consistency. Yeah, the big ones in this particular area, um, these are all respiratory related. What you just described. There's lots of ways we measure readiness, um, performance, fatigue. Like depending on which spectrum you're in here, we people will call these different things. Load management. There are performance based ones. There's the, these ones you've all mentioned are in the, the respiratory physiology side. So that's great. We'll just stick right there. Now HRV is one of them. Resting heart rate's another. More commonly though that we use our respiratory rate, and then you can look at something like CO2 tolerance. Let's just disregard those for now. <clears throat> we'll focus on respiratory rate. Or we'll focus on, yeah, on uh, uh, HRV and heart rate. Resting heart rate is a good sign if conditions are stable. If your resting heart rate becomes elevated at probably more than three to five beats per minute for more than a couple of days, that is a good sign something is happening. In this case, not a good thing, right? So it's starting to become elevated, as you said earlier, generally indicates you're getting overcooked, right? Too much training or allostatic load, total stress, like something. Not enough recovery. Or not enough recovery, calories, something's going on there. The issue with that is resting heart rate is incredibly unsensitive. It takes weeks for that to happen. You're well into that problem. And when you start seeing changes in resting heart rate, you are so far down that road that you've, like, we should have saw this weeks ago. Even first thing in the morning resting heart rate you're talking about? Or? 100%. Yeah. yeah. You will not see a change in first thing resting heart rate for a very long time into problems. The reason why people like HRV more is because it is far more stable. It is also like resting heart rate nonspecific. So you don't know what's happening, but that variability that you're mentioning that Ben talked about earlier, that's also the benefit. Once you establish somebody's standard deviation, where they normally fluctuate, right? Some people are going to be really neurologically or ner nervous system to be super stable. Some people's nervous system is really unstable. That itself is a marker. How wide you range on your daily HRV is incredibly telling to what's going on in your system. Because of that, that sensitivity, I can see things happening really quickly. Now, some of the common mistakes with HRV are looking at the flat score, right? You know, if I said right now, like, Ronald, what's your resting heart rate? And if I said your resting heart rate's 100 beats per minute, you know that's bad. If I said right now your HRV is 100, you have no idea if that means anything. I actually, I, I wouldn't know. I'd have to be like, okay, well, what device was that on? What conditions? Like, I still don't know. So the benefit of something like a heart rate is it's clear and defined for the most part, good and bad. HRV is not. It's really a moving target. So it's more sensitive, but it tells us information. The variability, like I said, tells us a lot. In addition to that, once I establish your normal standard deviation, when you start exceeding one especially two standard deviations for more than a couple of days, something is happening. And I will tell you right now, you will see that way before you start seeing changes in resting heart rate. That, that, that problem is going to occur way before. 
you don't want to overreact to a single day, as I mentioned. So you wake up, your HRV and your devices will pick a number. 70 normally. Some people will stay within 70 to 75 to 65. So their standard deviation would be like five milliseconds. Some people's normal standard deviation is 20. How do they how do they establish their normal standard deviation? 30 days. 30 days. Measure okay. for 30 days. And try to keep things stable. Take the average, right? Most of your tracker devices and stuff will like give you these numbers anyways. If you're more than outside that standard deviation for one day, eh, whatever. Don't really care, right? If it is three plus days, I typically am looking for five plus days. Five plus days of a continual pattern in one direction or the other, something is happening. Now it's non-specific, so there will be a lot of noise in the system. But again, I think this is like this is a feature, not a not a, a perk, not a, not a downside. Because we're gonna see, like, okay, did you change something in your food, in your sleep, in your environment? You know, fill in the blanks. Everything can tinker in there. We. Um, we, we will use HRV a decent amount. Some people, though, as I said earlier, they get so obsessed with those numbers, we take it away and go, hey, just how are you feeling today, right? Because of those exact problems Ben has mentioned. Like, like there'll be a ton of variability and people can't get this past. I literally was dealing with um, a client. He's like, we'll just say, sold a company early in life. He's in his 40s and just has way too much money, right? This is how he is. He surfs. That's what he does. Everything that we measure on him is fantastic. He's been in the program for probably a year and a half. So he's super dialed on everything. And he just can't get this HRV score out of his brain. Like he can't get it because he's just like, it's down, it's down, it's down. It's not down, right? For him, this is a normal number. And also, by the way, these technology companies, if you're using that stuff, they change algorithms constantly. So like your scores can there. So those are all the reasons if you're like paying attention to commercial HRV stuff, Ben is right. You should be super skeptical. Don't overinterpret those things. If you see something like resting heart rate change, that means something. There's no accident there. That wasn't because you had a bad night of sleep. And if you're consistently seeing an elevation of heart rate. One day difference in HRV could be nothing. It could be completely irrelevant to what you're doing. But that doesn't mean necessarily that, that it's a bad marker. When you're using it appropriately, there's a ton of information we can glean out of that. Um, specifically, again, where we find most of the value is even things like biofeedback training, right? We, we can develop more um, resilience within a, a, your nervous system, and you can objectively see that. And so we can use a whole bunch of different tools where we can give people, and we can say things like, okay, can you calm yourself down? Can you? Oh, yes, I can. Great. Well, then show me in your physiology. And you can see them looking at HRV data and going, oh, it's not moving. Oh, great. This is why we want you to go do A, B, and C, or they can, like a bunch of different ways you can do it. So that's a lot of value in HRV independent of just my single one ultimate recovery marker. In my opinion, respiratory rate is even better there. When you see changes in respiratory rate, this will happen way before changes in resting heart rate. And this itself will influence both resting heart rate and HRV. If you start breathing more, something is happening. Um, there's actually a really interesting paper. Laura Bloomfield did a couple of papers where she compared, she measured all these things, resting heart rate, sleep, HRV, um, and looked at stress. And one of the things she found in her second, actually two, two studies in the second one found that you'll see something like um, you're likely to have experiencing moderate to high stress one beat per minute increase in resting heart rate gave like a one to two percent increase in risk, but a one breath per minute change in resting heart rate was a twenty to thirty percent increase in likelihood of experiencing moderate to high stress, which is a way of saying that's that stuff will flag way before resting heart rate. Resting heart rate didn't do anything, didn't tell them anything about it, but HRV and specifically respiratory rate shot way up. You can see acute stress if I look at someone's data in the morning and your normal respiratory rate is say 12 breaths per minute overnight and you're at 14, I'm like, whoa, something's going on. If you're at 14 for two days in a row, boom, you're going to get sick the next day or you're already sick or something like, hey, it's going on around? Are you okay? Like what's going on? Like, no, my God, like something's happening. And so for me, when we're coaching people, like we're coaching them, I don't want to wait six weeks to start seeing problems happen. I need to go like, hey, this happened right now. What the heck is happening? What's going on? And from our opinion, HRV and respiratory rate 
will jump off the charts way before resting heart rate. How accurate are respiratory rate devices like that are measuring respiratory rate? Um, depends on the device you're using. Uh, if you start going out to the wrist and the hand, we start losing accuracy, right? If you're actually using a chest strap, we're getting better. When we really care about it, like in our, in our actually like sleep testing stuff, we're going to have a device directly on your chest. We're measuring not only respiratory rate, but we're measuring the amplitude of change in your chest. We're measuring the direct movement of it. Outside of that, though, respiratory rate's pretty easy to measure. But I mean, if something's if someone's doing this at home, are they going to be wearing a strap like you can't. they're sleeping? You can't, or you can wear your wearable. Your but watch, you, your you lose accuracy if you wear your watch. Um, for respiratory rate, it's okay. For HRV, we start to lose accuracy. But respiratory rate is actually pretty easy to pick up from a tracker. So you'd be okay there. HRV gets tricky. And 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 the respiratory rate, so you're talking you're you're mentioning the studies how stress would I mean is it's very sensitive to stress. Yep. And that's not just like psychological stress, it's just exercise, it's any type of stress on the body. Nutritional stress, environmental stress. Um again, you'll see uh if you remember a few years ago, well, a few years ago. We all remember COVID. There was a bunch of different devices that came out where uh, NFL and the NBA, actually, I think they did it with Aura. They were able to have these like pre-COVID flags. And we had a bunch of professional athletes. And I'll, I'll like, I'll give Aura some credit here. It was pretty good. And what I'm saying is we would get an alert. We're like, boom. It's like somebody has COVID. We're like, what? Mm. No signs, no symptoms. Right. And then days body later, temperature go up or boom. Well, it's, it's a combination. Respiratory rate. Right. And body temperature body temperature and a handful of other things. And they had this like fancy algorithm. They just opened it up like publicly. Yeah. Last year My friend, Dr. Ashley Mason's the one that's, um, she was involved with all that studies with us. Dude, it's fantastic. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll tell you, like I didn't look at the data. I didn't read the papers, but for our athletes, like it was pretty much spot on. We're like, damn. And you like have a day to prepare. You're like, okay, great. You're going to get COVID tomorrow. Like we just knew it was happening. So th- those things can be pretty sensitive. Even again, that's a wearable on their finger. And they were able to get good enough with their data to figure out you're going to get sick the next day. So it can be, yeah, stress, it can be nutrition, it can be actual like bacterial, viral infection, environmental exposure, um, allergens, tons of things like that can flag uh, that make people breathe more. 